I think when I take myself back to growing up as a kid in Edinburgh, the, the biggest memories of football, I mean football was the number one thing that any little school, school lad wanted to do. Um, I was very lucky, I was, I was born into a very much a working class family. Uh, Mum was stay at home, Dad worked in a factory, but Dad was massively into his football. So from my point of view, I was very lucky. He was a big Hearts fan, which well, it's standard that you follow your dad's team. Now, I've got two brothers that support two different teams in Scotland, but um, I was brought up a Hearts fan and just some of the memories there, and it was pre-all-seater stadiums. So we used to have, similar to the COP, there was an area at Tynecastle called The Shed, which was all standing area where most of the the hardcore supporters would stand and I'd get shuffled in there as a little lad be held up and watching the game and I think the, the overall memory you've got is a working class type of person going to the game. We also had flat caps up in, uh, up in Edinburgh as well, similar to down here. But the smell of Bovril, that Bovril and pie that you used to get, your dad would buy you, you'd smother it in sauce and you know, little memories, little smells, little sights that you would see and when you start to stand in the same area of a stadium, you get to know the guys around you, people you've never met before. And then suddenly you get to know names and my dad would start to know two or three people and they'd start to learn about me as a kid growing up and know that I would be playing football. They'd always ask how you got on for your school during the week and things like that and going in. Then you got to know the names of the players. Um, at one point actually, one of our school teachers was a board member at Hearts and he, and he got our school football team to become ball boys one game, and that was one of the highlights for me, um, was being a ball boy at Tyne Castle when your heroes are just standing yards away from you. So I can understand sometimes the kids that are around the stadium here at Hillsborough when, uh, when there's games going on on a Saturday. It's just, uh, I think it's that dream for any little kid. They want to be the one out in that grass and to get that close to it. And as I say, the little memories like that, just walking down to the stadium with hundreds, thousands of supporters with the scarfs on and the colours there and the songs that get sang. I think, I, th I don't think there's another sport like it, to be honest with you. Expectation levels were very, very high. I think the fan base had bought into it and were very, very positive. We came out and we got stuffed 3 nothing. I mean, but initially walking out uh, onto the pitch for the first time, you see the stadium virtually full for a League One game against Colchester. Um, that really sunk in to me, the size of the club, the potential of the club. and probably the, the task that we had in hand as a group at that season. And then to go out and lose the game 3-0 after such uh, high expectations of a good pre-season under our belt, that also brought, uh, brought into our heads the, the realisation that it was not going to be easy. Yes, we're involved at a, a big football club. Yes, we're in League One. Yes, expectation levels are high, but we're not going to get anything for nothing. Um, and that, for me, really set the tone for the rest of the season and made us all realise Listen, we're in for a hard battle here, we're going to have to get round each other. But the fan base, disappointed after the game, they stuck with us. We went over to Blackpool second game, got a result. Um, and thereafter, that season was so many highs, so many lows, ups and downs, but obviously finished on a, a real positive note. Football is such an emotive, emotional game. I think a lot of people out with football don't realise the, the mental side of it, where a fan base can make such a positive impact on an individual player, on a team in general. Um, players don't go out there and be totally oblivious to support. They, they don't. They hear shouts, they know when the fans are right behind them, they know if they've been having a bad game and they know to expect when it's going to uh, maybe the other side of the game. Listen, footballers love the pats in the back when everything's going well, so they have to stand up to the fact that at times you're going to have a bad game as an individual, as a team, so you're going to have to take the stick when it comes. But the positive impact they can have to get round an individual that's having a hard time, to get round the team when it's going through a hard time, to really push together, and that's where the togetherness between players' support um, can, can make a positive impact, and there was, there was no Bigger sign of that, no bigger sign of that when we went 2-1 down at Cardiff. The fan base was unbelievable, they really lifted the players and then we went into that extra time and there was only one team going to win it at that point. And that, that's only one instance of what that can bring to players, as I say, individually or collectively. Football matches can't be won alone. 
they can. An individual piece of brilliance, absolutely. Collectively, a team playing really, really well. But if you've got the fan base behind you as well, it's so, so important. And it, and it, can, it, can, it can intimidate opposition. It can lift their own players. It can push individuals to go above and beyond what they've done before, depending on where, where they've been and what's happened in the past. And I think, I think there's been instances in the past that we, we have got results when we weren't expecting it. Going back up to Hull, the 2005, um, just before we got into the playoffs, we needed a result. We had gone through a, a real dip in form and there was a chance that we could miss out in the playoffs. But that fan base that day, away from home, up at Hull, who had already qualified as uh, second place, I think they finished in the, in the league, they were having a party. We were going up there under pressure. But our away fans that day were, were, were just phenomenal, which drove the, the team on to get the result, which took us into the playoffs, guaranteed the playoffs. Um, so I fully believe that, that, that the fans can make such a positive contribution towards results on a, on a match day on a Saturday, absolutely. For me, it's a player's job to lift the fans, to push the fans to get going. On the other side of it, when the players are going through maybe a tough spell for 10, 15 minutes, the fan base can do the same to the team as well. Um, and every coach I've played with has, at times, on many occasions, used the, the fan base, used the support, whether it's home or away, to entice the players into a positive return. When we've had a couple of dodgy results, we owe the fans. When we're, when we're playing really, really well, keep the fans behind us. Keep playing well, keep pushing on, start the game well, get the fans lifted, that type of thing. So I think it is a, a big psychological message used by many, many coaches when, there's a, when you've got a support base that is, is or can be as vociferous as, as the Wednesday fans. Ultimately, the game at the top level has gone completely into a business. It's coming away from sport to a business sort of model. Uh, so therefore, it's more about pounds and pence than it is about making it a spectacle to supporters. I think every football team in the Premier League could have an empty stadium that still have enough money and make a profit or be able to run no problem. Let the fans in for nothing then if you don't need the money. You get the stadiums full. Why not? You don't need it. But it's never going to happen. I think from our, uh, the positive side of the championship, League One, League Two and that type of thing, it's real supporters still. And that has not been detrimental towards your Man U fans, Liverpool fans, Chelsea fans, Arsenal fans. It's real supporters where the club need that money from the supporter coming in the door. And the supporters need the club as, as much as the club needs supporters. Because it's that, as I, as I touched on earlier, I've grown up as a kid, You've got generations, you've got granddads going with fathers, going with sons now that are walking down and they're still been sitting in the same seats for year after year after year. It's a tradition, it's the, it's the way it is, it's people brought up in that sort of environment. And when you take that away from sport in general, sport and football, so you take that away from Sheffield Wednesday, then you've lost it. So it's important we've got to keep that, that togetherness from the club and the supporters. It's so, so important. I don't think you can walk away from a game like that having lost it without being disappointed. Um, and I think there was genuine emotion out on the pitch that day, one from the players, two from the coaching staff, and obviously I think there's, there's a photo of the ex-manager Carlos walking around and he was virtually in tears there. And I think that, that wasn't to do with losing the match. I think that was more to do with the emotion that the fans brought to that game on that day. And the way they just kept going for, especially the second half, as soon as it went off, they just continued, we're on our way. And that song sticks with you, you can look on YouTube and it sticks with you and it still brings that sort of nervous butterflies in you. We lost the game 1-0. So you should be absolutely devastated and we were devastated. The changing room was like a morgue when we went in, but it still brings smiles to your face when you think of that day. We stayed in the Hilton right outside Wembley, so we would look out our windows and it'd just be blue and white everywhere. The fans were bouncing. You'd get some stuff on social media the night before, the supporters um, in the centre of London bouncing around and outside the pubs and taking the whole place over. We had, uh, like you say, people 
uh, that work at Wembley. I've never ever seen a stadium bounce like that before and an atmosphere like that before and, and that's credit to every single one of them that comes here every, every weekend. And every other one that can't afford to get here every weekend were able to make that. That was just, it was, it was, I've been to two Scottish Cup finals, lost both. I've been to a playoff final uh, as a coach and lost that. But it's different because the fans were so positive at the end of it, even though we've been beat. Even though we've been beat, I think that full season gave the support base their, their pride back. And that support gave Wednesday its pride back because of the way they were on the day. They were, it's, a, it's another memory for a, a lot of younger supporters that maybe weren't at Cardiff, a lot of older supporters that had maybe been to Wembley with Waddle and Shez and, and Hursty. I think they'll still remember those days. They'll remember Cardiff because it was such an up and down day, but they remember Wembley for the atmosphere, for being there with friends and, and enjoying the occasion. Unfortunately, not the result. It sounds corny and you're going to sit and you think, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I've, I've sort of bought into the whole thing of being an owl, being involved with the club. I've got a little four-year-old, well, I've got four-year-old twins and I would like to think that even if I wasn't working at the club, I'd like to think I'd be bringing them along to Hillsborough to watch Wednesday. I'd like to think we'd be on a team, a supporters bus or in a car full of supporters driving to Derby, driving to Forest, driving to Fulham to watch Wednesday, driving to Brentford's, you know, these little places where you get proper atmospheres at football clubs, showing them proper football. Um, it's in the blood now and I would like to transfer that onto my little ones as well. So, nah, once you get involved at Wednesday, I don't think it leaves you. Think. Let's clarify one thing first. Walking out to a full Hillsborough, rocking, there's no better place to be. Close second and rewind it back 2005 to Cardiff, May 2005. Well, I think one of the biggest memories for me growing up as a kid was the 1978 World Cup in Argentina. Mario Kempes walking out with his Argentina teammates uh, in the World Cup final, and the ticker tape going everywhere, blue and white everywhere, and genuinely, I know, I know, it's a completely different level. You're talking about a qualification from League One to the Championship, and you're talking about a World Cup final. For me, walking out there and just looking round, just blue and white everywhere. I know Hartlepool were there as well, blue and white, but blue and white everywhere, balloons, scarves, flags, ticker tape. It was, it was just phenomenal. It was fully enclosed. The sound was echoing everywhere. That for me, a memory like that, it's hard to describe unless you were actually there. And then I think walking out with guys that we had built such a bond with over the season, and even the guys that weren't even in the squads, your Guy Branstons, your Graham Lees, your Matty Hamshaws, they weren't even stripped and you're, you're gutted for guys like that. But you know they had your back as you're the ones walking out with the pressure, but with the honour of doing that. And you've, I'd look behind me and I'd see John Paul McGovern, I'd see Stephen McLean on the bench, I'd see Lee Peacock, I'd see um, Richard Wood beside me and I, and I knew, I genuinely knew we had it. Might have changed with eight minutes to go when we were 2-1 down but I knew we, we couldn't get beat. We couldn't get beat because we had such a close bond that season. As I say, on paper, we were an average group of footballers but as a team we had a hell of a spirit that season. And walking out there, I don't know, there's a picture of me holding hands with the mascot, but my chest felt like 10 foot out. And it was just such a, such a proud moment for me and hoping, hoping was also for my family at the time. And just standing in that line, doing the handshakes, fireworks going off around us. It was just, that was the number one game in my footballing career as a player, absolutely. So to have the honour and to be able to do that with the armband on, you can't take that away from people. It's amazing. And then obviously the 90 minutes you go through and the extra time. It sums up the life of a Sheffield Wednesday fan in one match. Yeah. The ups and downs, the lows, the, you've got a player coming off the bench who's not kicked the ball for three months and gets taken a penalty within two or three minutes of being on the pitch or whatever it was. You've got a young lad who was discarded by Man City, scores the first goal in the, 
extra time. You've got John Paul McGovern who had a short spell across the city and then Excel take Livingston and scores and and then to sum it up, the one the one main memory for me, apart from lifting the cup, was when the silence that dropped over the stadium when Drew Talbot won that header on the halfway line has gone through. So surreal, you're watching it there, but peripheral vision, you're seeing people in slow motion just slowly start to lift out their seats as he runs, guides down on the goalkeeper, knocks it round the goalie when he knocks it, you just know, that's it, game over, and that's why you had that mass pile up, and I think it was just emotion, it was just relief, it was just, obviously, delight, and, and you could feel it flood down from the, from the stands as well, it's just, again, Playing with a club like Sheffield Wednesday, there's a hell of a lot more lows than there are highs. So when situations like that happen, it just feels a hundred times better than any, anywhere else, in my opinion.